Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Ray Carr Show. Our special guest is Melanie. And Melanie, welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you. Melanie, let's talk a little bit about your career. It's been a, a long, very exciting career with great music. Uh, where did it all begin for you? Can you start from this, you know, the very beginning, how you got interested? Uh, yeah, <laughs> the very beginning, like when I was born. Well, um, the you... very beginning, like when I first picked up my ukulele when I was four years yeah. old and my mother, my mother taught me how to play a, a baritone ukulele. Uh, when I was about four, I learned three chords. They were called the one, two, three chords. Because one had one finger, the other had two fingers, and the other had three. So that's how I knew. And um, I learned uh, several songs that she taught me. And then uh, I did sing on stage at my school when I was, uh, you know, just a pre kindergarten, I guess, kindergarten person, and um, they, uh, I, my guitar went out of tune, and to my mother's horror, I stopped, completely stopped, and I, I looked out to find my mother, and I said, it's out of tune, <laughs> <laughs> and so I ran over to her, and she had to tune it, because I, I didn't have to tune it. And she she fixed it, and her face was completely red. And she and she um, tells me she tells me that she was so embarrassed. And then, um, but she she gave me back the ukulele and uh, went back up and finished the song. That was the first thing I did on stage. Wow! And after that, was that kind of the impetus of all the other great things that would come afterwards? Yeah, yeah, you know, I always sang, and I always sang for people with a lot of prompting from my mother, you know, and, and I would always remember her saying she's shy. <laughs> and I, I think, you know, given the name, you play the game, so, like, my whole life I, I was shy until, really, until you know, 20, 30 years into it, I started feeling a little more, saying a little more, you know, just speaking out a few things here and there. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I mean, after that, we we did a, a television, a contest, not television, um, radio show. It was um, it was a contest that uh, between like you had to be a sibling or a mother, and daughter, or mother, and father, and, you know, two two related people had to be uh, uh, do a song or dance together or something. And my mother entered us. My, I would think I was, I don't know, really young. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have a recording. I sound really young. And um, I sang Give Me a Little Kiss. And my mother sang Stormy Weather or something. And we won. And we won a, a t I won as a, a runner-up prize. It was a runner-up. We won runner-up. Um, a man and his son won first prize. But I won a Tiny Tears doll, and that was a really revolutionary thing. You, you put the, a bottle with some water in the doll's mouth, and the doll would cry real tears. You had to squeeze the doll, of course, and the, the tears would come out of the little holes in her eyes. And then she would pee, and you could change your diaper. And this was the best thing that ever happened. I thought, this is a good business to be in. Wow. We're speaking with Melanie here on the Ray Carr Show. Melanie, um, let me fast forward a little bit here uh, to initially when you signed with Columbia Records, um, and then you released some stuff on Buddha Records. Can you talk about those particular days? Yeah, yeah. Um, um, you don't want to hear about um, my... My graduation from kindergarten. <laughs> oh, of, of course. I'm only kidding. I'm only kidding. I know. You said to start at the beginning, so I went way to the beginning. Um, yeah. The, the first, um, well, I had a little bit of an industry buzz was happening, but mostly in Europe. I was, um, I was singing in Europe. In fact, my first record that was a hit was, uh, was in, France. It was called Bobo's Party. And in France, they thought I was British, and in Britain, they thought I was French. And 
um, I, I just was, I was just kind of singing out in little places, but, you know, and people would bring business people and, and they were talking of signing me here and there and everywhere. And, um, I, um, that was my first, you know, brush up against the music industry. And I say against, I didn't even know where that came from, but (laughs) it came out of my mouth. Um, the, um, then I, during that period of time, Peter, my husband, who was the producer of every record I ever had um, from the very, very beginning, um, had an office in the same building that the people who were putting on Woodstock were um, in. And somehow, you know, it's in conversation, blah, blah, blah. Oh, they're having an Aquarian exposition, and it'll be three days of, you know, arts and crafts and music and oh this sounds great you know and Peter thought yeah we should definitely Melanie and yeah definitely Melanie and that was that and a year later I'm in England I have to fly back to do this festival it wasn't even called a festival it was the Aquarian Exposition and I'm picturing you know families with, with picnic blankets and you know pastoral setting and arts and crafts and jugglers and you know that kind of thing and uh, I had no clue no clue at all what I was getting myself into I went actually by myself with my mother my mother drove me I went up to um, where I had to be and then I found out I had to be somewhere else and I had to go to this other hotel in Bethel and uh, it was it's it had been changed and things were changed and go to this hotel and so I went and um, there I realized that the traffic we had been experiencing had something to do with this event. Oh yeah, and it's crazy. There was media media from one end of the hotel to the other and as I walked through the door, you know, uh, I was an unknown person. I mean, nobody ever heard of anything that I ever did except. Um, one DJ on WNEW FM was playing uh, Beautiful People, and, and nobody even knew how he got it because the record company had just gone through this big changeover where um, it, it used to always be people who knew music were running the company. Um, it was the days of the lawyer takeover, and Clive Davis was just... Um, assigned the presidency of of the CEO of Columbia Records, and he did not get it. I mean, he listened to this record uh, uh, between just the way I looked, and it was just pre-everything, you know. He um, just didn't get it. And so there were no records in record stores, and it, it spread like wildfire. It was being played, the beautiful people was being played all over the country on underground radio stations and nobody could buy the record. It was called a turntable hit. And that term I probably haven't heard for a long time. Oh, no, yeah. That's, but how was, um, in your opinion, looking back on Woodstock, do you think it really furthered your career a lot more and surprised you on the reaction that you got? Oh, my God. I was, I had, I was not prepared in any way, shape, or form for what happened before or after. <laughs> and, um, yeah, I mean, afterward, it, I mean, 500,000 people get to see you, and, and we even, it's just not, it wasn't just that they saw me, but I, I somehow resonated big time with everybody at the same time. It was, it was quite an amazing uh, moment you know, in the festival, and uh, and, and even the I mean, the people who were putting it on didn't didn't even put me in the movie because I was so unknown. But a few months later, I had um, put out this record called "Lay Down Candles in the Rain." Yeah, and my husband always said, "Call it Woodstock. Call it Woodstock." <laughs> I said, no, no, look, you know, all I wanted to call it candles in the rain. Um, and, 
they said, at least call the record lay down, <laughs> because that's the chorus. And I said, okay, I'll call it lay down, but then in parentheses, I want candles in the rain, because it was about the candles in the rain. In that right. moment, that, that just seemed like every single person that was in front of me, on the sides of me, and all in the periphery and everywhere else just seemed to get it at the same moment. And um, it was it was pretty amazing personal experience, but of course, as a career catalyst, I would say for sure. You know, it just bolted me to that next step from industry buzz to people who knew my name. And that, and that's great. And and even to this day, people really look back and they go, you know, Melanie, great performer, still doing great music, and that's wonderful. It really is. Thank you. Now, Melanie, a little bit after Woodstock, in 1970, um, you were performing at the Isle of uh, Isle of Wight Festival, and uh, Keith yeah. Moon, Keith Moon got to introduce you. Yes, you know, I, that, that was another one of those. I mean, people in this country don't know about it as much as they know about Woodstock. But the Isle of Wight in Europe was actually, there were 600,000 people at, at that festival, and it was from all over Europe. Isle of Wight is a little isle, island off England, and um, you, you had to get there by plane or hovercraft or something, and that many people descended on that, that, that place, and um, that, that day, uh, I, when I arrived, Donovan lent me his caravan so I could have a place, you know, to, to be that was had its own little privacy and, and a wood-burning stove, because it was, it was cold, it got cold, and everybody was lighting these little coal fires, and it was, the fumes were enough to kill you, you know, just from the coal-burning stoves and fires and stuff, so um, he, he let me his caravan, and when I got in, there was this guy, and he was kind of walking around fixing things in the caravan, I didn't, I didn't know who he was, and it was Keith Moon. And um, he, was, he was like being, being my roadie, you know. Uh, I don't know what possessed him, but um, that's what happened. He just kind of hung out with me all day until I went on and he introduced me. And thank God, because, you know, The Who had just, um, this was their debut of Tommy. Oh. So this was this mega rock opera production, pyrogenics you know, everything that the world had never seen before. And um, and they, uh, they introduced Sami, and they were on for two hours. And after that, it was, uh, by the time they got all their stuff off the stage, everybody cleared off. Nobody wanted to follow the Who. No one. And Jim Morrison was supposed to follow the Who, and he refused. Absolutely would not do it. And, and so, I don't know if why, but I, I said, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> and um, so I was on after the Who, and Keith Moon introduced me. Well, very courageous. Yeah, he was, because you know, he, the, the, after the after their performance, I mean, I don't think people quieted down for twenty minutes. You know, and it was pretty out, outrageous. What did you open the show with? I mean, what was your first song? Uh, I think, I know it was something really soft, because I, I mean, everybody was sleeping, you know, when I was over, and I, you know, oh well, you know, I'll sing them a lullaby. I don't know, it was either um, Close to It All, or a Tambourine Man, or something, I don't really remember. Any particular favorite cover songs that you did, that you still to this day enjoy doing? You know, I... Just like the term cover. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's okay. You did it. It's okay. People say it. It's what they say. And um, but um, no, I mean, because I I really grew up in a time when singers sang songs that other people wrote. Okay. So and and so to me, there were singers and there were songwriters. I just happened to become one that sang and wrote songs. They didn't have a term for that yet when I first started. They called me the female Bob Dylan because there really wasn't a term, singer-songwriter. Okay. But, um, so, so 
covering a song just has this, to me, there's, there's a, something in that word that sounds like you took a song and obscured it in some way. Oh, or, I understand. I understand. I, I just meant that. You know that, what I yeah. mean? Yeah. No, no, I'm not saying what you meant. I'm just saying what I take it as. But no, of course, it's a term that everybody uses. Oh, you did a great cover of, you know, whatever. But um, no, it's a term that I'm just, it's so such a weird word to use for singing someone else's song. But I think that, um, I mean, all the ones that I do, I, don't, I haven't really sung that many people's songs. I sang Ruby Tuesday, mm-hmm. Tambourine Man, uh, what else? Uh, I think it's going to rain today, Randy Newman. Who else? Who else? Yeah, there were a few others. Uh, I, I, it escapes me at this point. There aren't, there aren't that many, really. I, yeah. I, because, but, I, but I usually pick them because I wish I had written them myself and or, or found something in them that, you know, felt real familiar like they were they were just something that I felt so uh, Ruby Tuesday was me <laughs> yeah I mean I, I, I really enjoyed that and yeah, I'll tell you the song that I really enjoyed the most and I'm sure you hear this all the time Brand New Key I mean everybody says that but uh-huh. I, I just love the song and I grew up with it and I played it hundreds of times and it's just a wonderful tune uh, you know I, I mean I, I had to have a whole um Many, many different takes on that song. When it first came out, Peter, again, he was a record producer, and he heard the song, and I wrote it quite a bit um, slinkier and uh, slower, and he heard it, he said, no, I mean, this is a hit. I went, huh? <laughs> no, no, it's not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're going to speed it up a little bit. And, oh, no. And, you know, the line I always say, <laughs> if this is a hit, I'm doomed to be cute for the rest of my life. And sure enough, but uh, I have gone through it when it was a hit. You know, of course, I I enjoyed it. I, I sang it. I, I performed it. But then I kind of became a reactionary against it. You know, it was like, that's all anybody wanted to hear from me. And so I was not mature enough, really, uh, to understand, you know, it's a song. And, and it's one of your songs. Enjoy it. But uh, it, it just, I became typecast, you know, with this song. Mm-hmm. Because, I mean, everybody forgot Beautiful People or Candles in the Rain or Look What They've Done to My Song. It was all brand new key. <laughs> yeah. And, um... So, you know, it, it, I became a reactionary against it, and I didn't even want to do it anymore, but I did it. You know, I did it because I didn't want people to be upset with me uh, sometimes. I mean, there were times when I was feeling feisty, and I wouldn't do it, but uh, mostly mostly I did, and I, I really have now come to the place where I love the song. I can't even believe I wrote this song. <laughs> so, oh, it's a beautiful song. Where did song. that come from? It was so, it's so unique. I mean, it's just it's its own little thing, and and it it traveled through time, and still still lives, and they still use it in commercials and movies, and uh, you know, and it seems to even, I mean, I, I Miley Cyrus sang it. <laughs> no, uh, it's just like. Um, it just lives, you know. Oh, it so does. it's live. It's, I, it'll live forever. I really come to enjoy it. That's great. You know, I have to. I have to ask you about your up and coming concert in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Can you talk a little bit about the dates on that one, and um, you know, uh, a little bit background? On yeah. That. Um, well, I've been doing this um, periodically over the years. It's a Greenwood Coffee House, and it's not really a coffee house. I think it's a church. And um, it's a beautiful space, and I'm going to perform there on the 18th of September. Wow. And uh, what time will the concert begin? You're asking the wrong person. <laughs> Let's just assume it'll begin sometime after 6 p.m. So. <laughs> it's, uh, I'm sorry, what was that? No, it'll probably begin sometime after 6 p.m. I'll, I'll assume that. Yeah, yeah. It's not a daytime concert, that's okay. for sure. It's on my website. Go to my website. And what is that? Um, yeah, good question. It's Melanie. 
No, because I changed, I got a new name. I got MelanieSoska.com because it was always just Melanie. That's all right. I mixed it up. Anyway, yeah, if, if you wouldn't mind, help me and find my website. I will find um, it. I'll put it on my website. I'll, I'll look it up and I'll put it on mine. No problem. Thank you. Beautiful. And um, the one thing I wanted to say to you before I before I let you go is I, I was listening to Satellite Radio and I heard you on Cousin Brucie's uh, oldie show and I was very impressed with that. And I, and I just said, boy, you know, it would be great to have her on my show too. Ah, oh, great. Well, thank you. And uh, you're, you're a great artist and I wish you nothing but the best and uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, I, I um, hope to be in uh, Ohio pretty soon. I have, I, 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 you know, I didn't talk about it, but my um, my husband passed away a few years ago, and uh, he was my producer, my manager, everything, agent. And he handled everything in my career, and it, it was such a shock that, um, you know, Bo, my son, and I are... Uh, still performing we were on the road when it happened and uh, so I'm sort of taking over things you know that he did and I'm not really good at it <laughs> but uh, that's what I'm doing and so i um, trying to organize tours and dates and uh, it's it's a whole other universe I'm in but that's what I'm doing well, I, I wish you the best, and um, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. You have a nice day. Okay. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.